can move the mountains let the mountains move we've come with expectation waiting here for you waiting here for you
and it's you we adore singing hallelujah we're singing at us sometimes a million miles an hour ready to throw on us its worst but Lord also still bringing to us its best Father we thank you that you are the Lord of creation that Father you are the giver of life but Lord we understand that at times life is ready to move on and Father we thank you that you are the author of our salvation you have brought to us an opportunity as we've already talked about to not only sing about heaven but to know of others that were there experiencing it. So, Father, thank you for that privilege to know that truth, to relish in it, to celebrate it, to remember that you are our Lord of creation, our author of salvation. Your faithfulness is true at all times. Lord, thank you for being our God, our King. We are here to honor you, to remember that, to lift you up, to exalt you.
When we choose to allow pride into our lives, it is built one brick at a time. It often starts small, but each additional thought or action is capable of building a tower dedicated to self. The result is often marvelous, a specimen of achievement, seemingly free from flaw or defect. But this image is built on nothing more than a foundation of self. As it climbs higher, the structure weakens, and as time passes, holes begin to appear, each one a small clue alluding to the facade of the design. Bit by bit it grows, becoming unstable as it is weakened by its own attempt to outbuild its flaws. And then eventually it happens. The weight of the whole system becomes too much to contain and it collapses. Each piece of false glory crumbles to the ground, leaving us right back where we started with an opportunity to build again. Perhaps this time on a stronger foundation. You know, we live in a culture where we revere champions. If you have a favorite team that you root for, you want your team to win. We make idols and we put up on the pedestal people who are good in sports, champions, people who are uh, A, uh, they're on their A game and top of their list. This is what we revere in our culture today. We play games to win. No one ever plays a game to lose. Matter of fact, some people cheat to win. That's how important winning is. And you know what's interesting is no one ever had to teach us how to cheat, right? I mean, like when we were real little, real, real, real little, we started lying and cheating without anybody ever teaching us how to do that. Miranda has always been a little game player, and she and I have always loved playing games. Of course, when she was one and a half and two, the games were, you know, hi ho cherio and all these fun, riveting games. And uh, we would sit in the floor and we'd play these little board games. And even at two years old, she'd try to cheat. I'd look over and, my goodness, she's taking two or three cherries off her tree without thinking I'm looking. Put them in her little bucket. It's in our nature. We want to win. We want to be on top. And we're even willing, in, unless we're convicted by the Lord, we're even willing to cheat. Unfortunately, a lot of us, when we were young, we didn't learn that lesson. We grew up to be big people who still cheat. Prisons are filled with CEOs who cheated. And in the cause of their cheating, a lot of people lost a lot of money. And so cheating is nothing new. This is how important winning is. This is how important finishing on top is to a lot of people. Losing stinks. Plain and simple, that's a fact. Losing stinks. Would you agree with that, yes or no? No one ever competes to be last. We don't have, you know, a bowl game, you know, for losers. We don't have, like, the loser's bowl. You know, or maybe more important, maybe uh, more correctly, the toilet bowl. I don't know. <laughs> Although that is a pretty good idea. Coming to you live from California, the toilet bowl. And then the teams are out on the field during the toilet bowl and they're letting it, no, you score. No, 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 really, you score. I mean, this isn't normal. This is not how we approach games. No, we approach games to win. We celebrate those who are winners. We make champions out of them and we idolize them. And just like in the video, sometimes this Jenga game that you saw in the video is, is kind of like our life. We build this tower as a monument to ourself and it's built on our pride, if we're really honest about it, and then something comes along. Life happens. The enemy wars against us like Jesus told us he would, and there begins to be holes in our life. And because we've not built our life on a good foundation, eventually that tower, that monument we've built to ourselves, it crumbles. In a culture where we revere champions, where we celebrate those who are winners, Jesus comes along and he says, we need to be last and we need to be least. That's odd. Proverbs 16, 18 says this, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit 
before a fall. I'm not asking you to say out loud or to raise your hand, but I, I bet most of us know somebody, or maybe several, in our life. We could name somebody who we absolutely saw this verse play out in their life. Somebody who bragged, somebody who boasted, who had their full confidence in their ability, and then before too long, we saw them fall. We've seen celebrities. We've seen national figures. We've seen people that we once as a culture revered fall greatly because man built them up on, and put them up on such a pedestal. And then we found out they were human, just like you and me. And a life lived apart from Christ is a, is a life destined to be broken. The only difference between a lot of these people that we see on TV whose life has crumbled, the only difference between them and you and me is theirs is televised, ours isn't. Jesus spoke a lot about being last and least. I don't have time this morning to go through all the scripture that talks about this concept of being last and least. Jesus always noticed the least of these. Jesus noticed as he was worshiping on the Sabbath, all the religious leaders coming in and dropping off their incredible amounts of money in, in the temple. And they were boastful about it. And would try to outdo the other. Look how loud my offering is as the coins would clang in the big urns. And then along comes this widow. She had her two little mites. Would hardly equal a penny in our day. And she puts them in quietly and she goes and has a seat. And Jesus says to his disciples, see that lady over there? She's given more than anybody in here. Jesus noticed the least of these. Jesus would walk through the towns and, and, and the streets of his community and somebody would holler out to him, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And all the people would ignore. And yet Jesus would stop. And even sometimes when he would stop to help people, his own disciples would be like, Jesus, you don't have time for this. Come on, come on, we're busy. Let's go. And Jesus would stop to the least of these and say, what would you like me to do for you? So in Jesus' world, the least were very important. But in our world, it's only those who are really good at what they do who find their way to a level of importance. And unfortunately, in our culture, the least of these many times goes unlooked and unnoticed. What did Jesus mean about being last? What did Jesus mean about being the least of these? And even if we define that, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to our flesh. How can we have joy in being last and being least? That's what I want us to discover today. If you would, go with me to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 9. We're actually going to be in two Gospels today. I want to read the same story from two different perspectives. In Mark chapter 9, in verse 33... It says this, they came to Capernaum when he was in the house, talking about Jesus. He asked them, his disciples, what were you arguing about on the road? I love this, verse 34, but they kept quiet. If you have a sibling, you can appreciate this, right? You're upstairs or you're on the other side of the house and you and your brother or sister or brothers and sisters were going at it and all of a sudden mom hollers down the hall, hey, what are you all doing in there? Everybody's up. Like, why? Because you were embarrassed. You got busted. You knew the argument was wrong. And all of a sudden, the referee says, hey, I'm blowing the whistle. What's going on here? The disciples were arguing. And, and notice what they were arguing about. We're going to talk about this a little bit later. But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. And sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and he said, if anyone wants to be first... He must be the very last and the servant of all. What a paradoxical statement. I mean, if it sounds strange to you and me, believe me, it sounded strange to the audience Jesus was speaking to. If anyone wants to be first, he must be last and the servant of all. Well, let's find out more about this story. Go over with me to the book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, and look with me in the 18th chapter. 
We're going to find out a little bit more about this story, again, from a different perspective and look at the events surrounding this argument. In Matthew's Gospel, he includes an incredible question that comes out of this argument that I want us to soak on for a few minutes today. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, it says this, At the time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who is the greatest? You see, this attitude that would prompt them to even ask this question was really a me-focused attitude. Self-centered. And when you and I, we all know people in our life who are self-centered. And if we're really honest with ourselves, there have been times we have struggled with our own self-centeredness. Man, the disciples were very much struggling with it, and I don't even know if they knew it fully. Their me-focused question. Number one, and I hope you'll write this down. It followed an incredible spiritual mountaintop experience. This me-focused question was sparked, I believe, by an incredible mountaintop, literally, spiritual mountaintop experience. In Matthew's Gospel, he lets us in on something. Go back to Matthew chapter 17, just one chapter, and let's look and see what happened here in the first few verses. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And there he was transfigured before him, before them. The church, check this out. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as the light. Just then... There appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. Notice what was happening in the disciples' life. They were handpicked by Jesus to go up on top of this mountain. And there before them, they saw Jesus in his glory. They saw him in a way they had never seen him before. And then they got to witness an incredible meeting with Jesus and some prophets. And they really, they really didn't know what to do. I mean, Peter, of course Peter, it has to be Peter, has to open his mouth first. It seems that this guy was always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. And I guess in the, in, in, in the situation there and the awkwardness of it, all Peter could do is just say, man, it's good to be here. I'll build a shelter for all of you. Notice Jesus didn't even respond. God said... This is my son, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Think about a time in your life when you've had an incredible mountaintop experience. Maybe it was the experience surrounding your own conversion when you trusted Jesus with your life. Maybe it was a camp or a retreat or a particular worship service. You've had these spiritual mountaintop experiences just like the disciples. But church, hear me well. Those spiritual mountaintop experiences were never designed for you and me to be prideful about. They were never designed for us to boast in. And yet so many people, when they have a spiritual mountaintop experience, they love to lord it over people. Now I'm going to break a lot of your hearts here just for a minute. A lot of you... And me, myself included, grew up singing an old hymn entitled, In the Garden. If you know that song, if you know the chorus to that song, sing it with me. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. Listen to this line. And the joy we share as we tarry there. Depending on the minister music you have, you'd hold that for 15 beats. 
What's the next line? Sing it with me. None other has ever known. Wait a minute. He walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy that we share as we tarry there, no one else has ever known. Am I really that special where I can sing that? We love that hymn, but I want you to listen to the message one more time. And the joy that Jesus and I share, no one else has ever known. Well, I'm hoping the hymn writer meant no one else has ever known from his perspective. But church, unfortunately, sometimes we feel like we have a relationship with Jesus that is so special, so unique, no one else could possibly reach the level we are. What Jesus did for me, he's done for you. And the intimacy that Jesus and I enjoy, he wants to enjoy with you. If you believe that, say amen. amen. This isn't an exclusive club. This is Jesus to all of humanity. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in and I will have fellowship with you. Jesus says, I don't love anyone else more than I love you. And the joy that we've seen thousands and thousands and thousands and millions and millions of people share with Jesus, that same joy can be your joy today. I'm not picking on in the garden. I grew up singing it. And just so you're not too mad at me, Pastor Wes can tell you, I was president of our hymnology society in seminary. So I love hymns, okay? But we just got to understand that this relationship we have with Jesus, it's not exclusive. It's not like he does for me what he won't do for you. And with all due respect, I live a life where people say to me, Pastor, I know you've got a special end with God. Say a word for our weather. I mean, I've had that this past week. Listen, I don't have a special end, guys. I don't have any more special end than you do. The same access to God through Jesus Christ that I enjoy is the same one you enjoy. Believe me, I'm not that important. I don't have a special end. I think the disciples thought for a moment they had a special end with Jesus that no one else would ever know. Why do I know that? Because following this incredible spiritual mountaintop, they were arguing about who was going to be greatest. But some other things happened. Their question was sparked by this spiritual mountaintop experience. And by the way, watch out. Watch out, watch out, watch out. If you're enjoying a spiritual mountaintop experience right now, praise God, watch out. The enemy will soon begin his work to try to rob you of that joy. Have you ever had a spiritual mountaintop experience? One day everything was right in the world and the next day your life was crumbling and falling apart? Anybody ever experienced that? Okay. You know why? Because many times spiritual mountaintop experiences are followed by a season of temptation and trial. How can I say that? Because in Jesus' own ministry, we read it. Jesus was with the Lord's Holy Spirit communing as a trinity. He was baptized to begin his ministry. The voice from heaven said, once again, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. And Jesus began his ministry. And following this incredible mountaintop experience, the Bible says the Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the desert to be tempted by Satan. Listen, if you're on a mountaintop, praise God. Just know the enemy is lurking and temptations and trials will follow. That's not in and of itself bad news. The good news is, as I preached to you last week, when evil is close, who is closer, church? Jesus. The reason I even give mention is because I've had so many people, particularly new believers, say to me, man, when I gave my life to Christ, my life started falling apart. Pastor, what happened? Is God mad at me? I mean, before I became a Christian, things were like so-so, but it seems like the closer I get to God, the more temptation, the more trials I seem to go through. That's because Satan wants to do everything he can to convince you you made the wrong decision. But take heart, Jesus said. 
I've overcome the world. And that trial or temptation that you may be going through right now, Jesus has overcome it. Draw closer to him every single day. Amen? So the, the uh, disciples' question was sparked by this mountaintop experience. But secondly, it was fueled then by their pride. In Matthew 17, we continue to read, skip down to verse 14. And when they came to a crowd, now remember, they came down off the mountain. They've just seen Jesus in his glory. And here it is in verse 14. When they came to a crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or onto the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Look at Jesus' response was. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. Notice the disciples' response. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? A while ago, Peter was saying, Lord, it is good to be here with you. Wow, look what we get to experience on this mountaintop. Jesus, we get to see you in your glory. Jesus, we get to see you with the prophets. Lord, this is amazing. Lord, I have a question. Why couldn't we drive out the demon like you just did? Look what Jesus' answer was. Because you have so little faith. Jesus is saying, guys, you saw me in my glory. You witnessed something that no one else got to see. I brought you to a very intimate place with me. And you got to see something amazing. And you didn't even have enough faith to drive out a demon. I believe it's because the, the disciples were feeling kind of prideful about their experience with Jesus. Look what we got to do that no one else got to do. Jesus only took a few of his disciples, three of his disciples. Can you imagine what pride they hid in their heart? We're special. We're in the in club. Therefore, they were shocked that they couldn't drive out this demon. See, the temptation in our flesh is we don't have to have faith. Why? Because I'm all that. I mean, the Lord thinks enough of me to bring me up on a mountaintop with him. I don't need his help. I must be special. And Jesus said, you have so little faith. Now he tells us how small their faith was. Check it out. I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus said you didn't even have enough faith of a mustard seed. See, Jesus knew the disciples' heart. And where you would think they'd have this incredible mountaintop experience, it would humble them. And make them have even greater faith. The opposite seemed to have taken place. Not only was their question sparked by this mountaintop experience, not only was it fueled by their own pride, but thirdly, it ignited what I think is supreme selfishness. Mark tells us that they argued. We covered that a while ago. Jesus said, hey, what are you arguing about? Mark's perspective is they kind of got quiet. In other words, uh-oh. But eventually they must have had the courage to ask, as Matthew says, then they asked Jesus, well, here's what we were arguing about. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They were arguing about who was going to be the greatest. It seems like they were more concerned with that than they were this little boy who was struggling with a demon. And maybe that was their hindrance. Maybe that's why they couldn't minister to this young boy. Church, I believe they were even more concerned about being first than they were Jesus' own death. Why do I say that? Look what happens. Verse 22 of Matthew 17. 
Jesus said, if you just had faith of a mustard seed, you could have moved mountains. For then nothing will be impossible for you. Then look what happens, verse 22. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day, he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. Well, sure they were. Their Lord, their friend, just said, hey, let me tell you, I'm going to die. And it's going to be a cruel, ugly death. And their hearts were sad. And the Bible says they were filled with grief. But apparently it wasn't enough grief to break them to where they didn't argue about well, who's going to be the greatest. It just seemed like no matter what experience they went through with Jesus, they couldn't get their focus off themselves. We saw Jesus in His glory. I'm special. Why can't I do ministry? I'm special. Jesus, you just told us you're going to be delivered into the hands of men and, and killed. That saddens me. Well, I have a question. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They were so concerned with being first, their perspective was skewed on reality. And I believe this happens to a lot of us even today if we're not careful. We're so focused on being the best. We're so focused on being in front of the line. We're so focused on our image and making sure that people don't think lowly of us. We're so concerned with impressing people that sometimes we'll even fudge the truth to impress others. And Jesus said, there's great joy in being last and least. So how do we reconcile this? Matthew 18, look what Jesus' response was to the disciples' question. Jesus, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Verse 2, he called a little child and he had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. I don't know if we can fully appreciate that, but we need to understand in Jesus' culture, children were property. Children had no significance in the community other than to their parents. The greatest contribution that a child can make would be to be male and to carry on the bloodline. Children were insignificant in Jesus' culture. They were overlooked. They were vulnerable. Children were powerless. We get hints of this through Scripture because it seems when children interrupted Jesus, his disciples got upset. They wanted to send them. Jesus, send these little brats away. They're getting in our way. And yet Jesus stooped down and picked one up and said, guys, you're missing it. You are so focused on yourself. You are so focused on being the greatest but unless you're willing to become like one of these, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. I personally think there's no greater perspective on life than through the eyes of a small child. I've only raised one, but there's a lot of children that have been raised in this room. A lot of, I'm speaking to a lot of parents, right? And wasn't it great to watch your children discover new things? Aren't children hilarious? By the way, we have a children's ministry that could use a lot more help. Children's ministry is awesome, and I just want you to begin praying about it. Maybe God's going to use you in the life of one of our children. There's such joy in working with our kids. But don't you just love the perspective of life through a child's eyes? I just love it. I mean, I have laughed more since becoming a parent than ever before. 
And things that would stress me out or things that Kristen and I would tend to worry over, many times the wisdom from the back seat humbles us very quickly. Because children have just that innocent approach. They just see things for how they are and they just call it out. They've not matured enough to have a lot of filters in place, so they just tend to say what it, what it is. I've shared with you several stories of Miranda's childhood and t times when she's embarrassed us because she just, what she saw, that she just called it out. Like the uh, clown in public, y'all remember that? The cross-dresser who wore makeup. If you're visiting here today, you're like, you've got to tell this story now. I'll tell you real quickly just to bring y'all up to up to speed on this. So we're in Publix and we're in the chips aisle or cookie aisle or whatever and, and Miranda says, Mommy, Daddy, look, a clown. And we look over and it was a man dressed like a woman. And it looked at us, kind of funny. And we're like, no, honey, no, no, that's, that's, that's not a clown, that's, that's a bird on the crackers. No, not that, that, that's a clown. But there have also been times when maybe Kristen and I have been driving along, along in the car and we've been talking about something and, and maybe we've been even saying things like, you know, I wonder what's going to happen. And maybe we've been worrying over something. And then this wisdom from the back seat says, don't forget God loves you. Don't forget we're supposed to have faith. Don't forget what's really important. And I'm like, man. And I think that's what Jesus was, was getting to. I think Jesus was saying, do you see the purity in this life? Do you see this life that is so humble, that is so vulnerable and so powerless? See, until you become like that, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. As long as you think you can handle this thing on your own, this thing called life on your own, as long as you think you don't need my help, as long as you think you're all that, chances are you won't see the kingdom of heaven because there's no room for your pride in heaven. That's what got Satan kicked out. Paul says in one of his letters, don't think more of yourself than you ought to. Why would Jesus take the child and make this statement? Well, I believe several things happen when you and I truly discover the joy of being last and least. See, in our humility, I believe we can hear God clearly. See, our selfish desires is what ushers in things that distract us. But I believe when you and I are humble like this little child, when we're willing to be last and least, I believe that's when we can truly hear God clearly. Secondly, I believe not only do we hear God clearly, but I believe we sense His prompting in our life. See, our selfishness has a way of clouding our thinking. But when we're free of that and we're, and we're willing to be last and least and to exalt Him, we sense His prompting in our life. Not only do we see Him clearly and we sense His prompting, but thirdly, we then begin to rely on His strength. We begin to rely on His power instead of allowing our pride to convince us, I got this, we can do this, I can do this. If I need any help, I'll let you know. Otherwise, I'm good. And then we grow weary even in trying to do good because we're relying on our own strength. Jesus gave us a great promise. I am the vine, you are the branches. You remain in me and I will remain in you, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Not only do we hear God clearly, not only do we sense His prompting in our life, and we can rely on His power, but we can also feel God's presence. See, our selfishness has a way of making you and me feel isolated. Some of the loneliest people on this earth right now are the rich and the famous. Those who think they've arrived and they don't need anyone. And then we're able to discern his plan for our life. You see, in our pride, we will let our selfish ambition lead us down the wrong road. We'll pursue the wrong thing, but when we're humble, when we're willing to be last and least in our humility, we begin to feel God's presence in our life. And church, when we do that, we can discern His plan for our life. So let me ask you today, just very simply, do you want God's best for your life? 
And it's a simple question, yes or no. Do you want God's best for your life? Okay, let me ask it again. Do you want God's best for your life? Then you must be willing to be last and least. In our family, we kind of got a weird little tradition. When we go to potlucks, we always go last. Now, there's a little bit of a selfish ambition there. I got to fully confess because I get to eat all the stuff y'all leave behind. But aside from that, we're trying to teach our daughter, we don't have to be first in line. We're no one special. We don't have to be first. The Sunday y'all hosted me to come preach in view of a call, y'all held a beautiful potluck lunch for us, and you had us go first. I got to tell you, it was the first time in our ministry, I guess, we've done that. It felt weird. And I don't mean that rudely. It just felt weird because we always, we want to go last. And I don't say that arrogantly, but we have learned the joy of being last and least. I get more fried chicken than all of you combined. It's awesome. We've learned the joy of being last and least. Truly, we've learned the joy of humbling ourselves. Because when we humble ourselves, then it's the Lord that lifts us up. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. You want to be first in the kingdom of heaven? You must be willing to be last and least and humble yourself. I don't know how this hits you. I don't know where this hits you this morning. I know how God has used it in my life. And I will tell you it's a daily lesson. It's a daily lesson in dying to self and living according to Jesus' will. It's a daily thing to humble myself and to let God be God. Because when life doesn't go my way and things don't happen the way I think they should, I can keep a proper perspective. It's not my job to tell God how to be God. It's just my job to surrender. I'm going to ask the worship team to come and they're going to lead us in a response this morning. Friend, if you're here today, the greatest thing that pride will keep you from if you're here today without a relationship with Jesus Christ is to keep you in a place where you have yet to give him your heart. If you're here today and you think, I mean, I kind of believe in God, I kind of acknowledge that, but I, this whole becoming a Christian thing, I don't know. Pride will keep you from humbling yourself and saying, I've messed up in life and I need Jesus who died for my mess ups to forgive me. I need to give him my heart. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. We've all messed up. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, what we deserve for those mess ups is to die and to be eternally separated from God forever. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I want that. I want that gift. How can I make it mine? The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you believe in your heart, Jesus is Lord, and you confess that belief, then you will be saved. We're going to have a time where we worship in just a moment through singing and responding. If you're here today without Christ and you would like to know more about how you can give Him your heart, I'll be here at the front. I'd love to talk with you. And we'll pray together. And I'll help try to help you understand fully what your decision is about. Believer, you're here today maybe and maybe if you were really honest with yourself, you're kind of like these disciples. You've experienced some things in life where you've gotten a little bit prideful. You're not a rude, arrogant person. There's just some pride in your life that maybe causes you to refuse others' help. Or to kind of have the attitude, God, I've got this. If I, if I need you, I'll let you know. It takes humility to even admit that. But maybe that's where you are this morning. You just want to pray with someone. I'll be here to pray with you. Or if you just want to come to the front and pray. Maybe there's another matter in your life today. Maybe it has nothing to do with what I've preached on. Maybe God's just broken your heart about something. Maybe there's a friend that your heart's broken for. That you want to pray for and you would like others to pray for you and with you by you coming to the altar and praying and kneeling we've got people who will come along behind you and just pray over you you don't have to talk if you don't want to 
but I invite you to come to the prayer altar if you so choose. However God's leading, would you let him lead and would you respond in obedience? Let's pray. Father, this is a very difficult lesson to learn because we are inundated day in and day out with how to win, how to succeed, how to be number one, how to be first. And yet you come along and you tell us there's great joy in being last and least. Lord, you teach us that when we're willing to do that, you lift us up and we find our identity in you. And there's such joy in that. So we thank you for telling us not maybe what we want to hear all the time, but telling us what we need to hear. And so, Father, I just pray that you would have your will and way in our life, even in these moments as we respond to you. That we would be willing to be last and least. That we would be willing to serve and not be served. We, we would be willing to discern clearly your plan for our life and not allow our pride to get in the way to keep our focus on us but to put our focus totally on you Lord we need your help we need your strength so would you work in our hearts today we commit these things to you in Jesus name church I'm going to ask that you stand and as we sing you come if God's leading